Section 1 of Strangers at Lisconnel by Jane Barlow This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Carson Section 1 Chapter 1 Out of the Way To Lisconnel, our very small hamlet in the middle of a wide bogland, the days that break over the dim blue hill line faint and far off seldom bring a stranger's face but then they seldom take a familiar one away beyond reach at any rate of return before nightfall in fact there are few places amid this mortal change to which we may come back after any reasonable interval with more confidence of finding things just as we left them due allowance being made for the inevitable fingering of time. We shall find some old people who have aged under it, and some who, as certain philosophers would hold, have grown younger again. The latter may be seen just beginning, perhaps, to sit up stiff on a woman's arm, or starting for a trial crawl over Mother Earth, and of them we remark that there is another little Ryan or Quigley, while the former stay sunning themselves so inertly or totter about so shakily that we notice at once how much old Sheridan or the widow Joyce has failed since last year. These babies and grandparents often associate a good deal with one another at the stage when the old body is still capable of keeping an eye on the child and the child still resorts to all fours if it wants to get up its highest speed. But this companionship does not last long in any given case. Very soon the expanding and the contracting sphere cease to touch closely. On the one hand, the world widens into more spacious tracts for nimbler and bolder ranging over with all manner of remarkable things growing and living upon it, to be gathered and captured or at least sought and chased among pools and hillocks and swampy places on the other it shrinks to within the limits of a few dwindling furlongs and perches traversed even more feebly until at length even the nearest stone on which the warm rays can be basked in seems to have moved too far off and the flicker haunted nook by the hearth fire becomes the end of the whole day's journey. Thus the generations, as they succeed one another, wave-like, preserve a well-marked rhythm in their coming and going, play, work, rest, not to be interrupted by anything less peremptory than death or disablement. This wag by the wall swings and swings its bobbed pendulum without pause, but one swing is much like the other, and their background never varies. Little pat out stravading of a fine morning on the great brown-wigged bog, and it may be hoped, enjoying himself thoroughly, is taking the same first steps in life as young Pat, his father, now busy cutting turf sods, and old Pat, his grandfather, idly watching them burn with a pipe, if in luck, to keep a light, and the Lisconnel folk, therefore, because the changes wrought by human agency come to them in unimposing forms, are strongly impressed by the vast natural vicissitudes of things which rule their destinies. The melting of season into season, and year into year, the leaf-like withering and drifting away of the old from among the fresh springing growths are ever before their eyes and the contemplation steeps them in a sense of the transitoriness of things good and bad even the black soil they tread on may next year flutter up into a vanishing blue column through a smoke hole in somebody's thatch they carry this sense with a light and heavy heart. In like manner, they make the very most of all unusual events. They find materials for half an hour's talk 
in the passage by their doors of one of those rarely coming strangers who do appear from time to time as frequently indeed as anybody would expect having surveyed the thoroughfare that links us with humanity for if we follow it southward where like the unvanishing wake of some vessel it streaks the level plain that is lonely as a wide water but stiller we pass by dan o'burn's forge now neighbourless and through the humble doof plain and on to ballybrosna our town but we must go many a mile further to reach anything upon which you would bestow that title or if we turn northward we only find it seeming another ample fold of bogland outspread far and far beyond lisconnel before a grey hill range begins to rise in slow undulations crested with firs and broom here we smell turf smoke again and see a cabin row that is sullenberg and hence the road strikes northwestward in among the mountains where a few mottled faced sheep peer down over it from their smooth green walks but do not care to trust their black velvet legs upon it and then by the same time that the air has become sea-scented the road climbs to the top of a hill and stops there abruptly as if it had been travelling all the while merely to look at the view the truth is that the funds for its construction would go no further and in consequence wayfarers coming along by the shore still have to tread out a path for themselves across a gap of moorland if they are bound for lisconnel you may perceive therefore that lisconnel lies out of the way on the route to no places of importance and as its own ten or a dozen little houses are i fear collectively altogether insignificant it has small reason to expect many visitors the widow mcgurk said one day that you might as well be living at the bottom of a bog-hole for any company you got the chance of seeing but this was an exaggeration she was vexed when she made the remark because mrs dooley old dan o'burn's married daughter then staying at the forge had promised to come and inspect a pair of marketable chickens in anticipation of which mrs mcgurk had wetted a cup of tea and used up her last handful of oatmeal for a cake that mrs dooley who was in rather affluent circumstances might not think them too poorly off altogether but after all the hours had slipped blankly by and nobody had arrived so the widow had ruefully put her teapot to sit on the hob until himself came in for properly speaking she was at this time not yet a widow and had stepped down her tossocky slope with her double disappointment to mrs kilfoyle mrs kilfoyle was knitting at her door and not looking out over the bog where the flushed light of the sunset drowsed on the black sod in an almost tangible fire film against it the poppies stood up dark and opaque but the large white daisies had caught the wraith of the glow on their glimmering discs she had been thinking how not so long ago her thun thaddy used to come whistling home to her across the bog when the shadows stretched their longest the sunset still came punctually every evening but had grown wonderfully lonesome since the kick of a cross-tempered cart-horse had silenced his whistling and stopped his home-coming for ever thaddy's whistling had been indifferent considered as music yet it had sounded pleasant in her ears and mrs mcgurk's trouble seemed to her not very serious however she replied to her complaint ah sure woman dear like enough she might be here to-morrow and if she is she'll be very apt to not gare e'er a chuck or a chicken off of me not the feather of a one said mrs mcgurk resentfully 
plenty of other things I have to do besides wasting me time waiting for people who don't know their own minds from one minute to the next, and making a fool of meself, stargazing along the road, and nary a foot stirring on it no more than if it was desolate wilderness. She would not for the world have alluded to her expenditure of more material resources, and accordingly had to explain her vexation by putting a fictitious value upon her time, which in reality was just then drearily superabundant. Sure, suggested Mrs. Kilfoyle, the poor woman maybe was kept at home some way, and she would every intention to be coming. I declare now, you'd whiles think things knew what you was mainin' in your mind, and rise themselves up again it a purpose to prevent you. They happen that contrary. As Mrs. McGurk's experience did not dispose her to gainsay this proposition, and she was nevertheless disinclined to be mollified by it, she likewise had recourse to generalities, and said, "'Deed, then, it's welcome anybody is to stop away, if they're wishful, hindered or no. Long sorry I'd be to have people distressing themselves, streeling after me.' and she added rather inconsistently the remark already mentioned but the likes of this place i never witnessed you might as well be living at the bottom of the blackest old bog hole there for e'er a chance you have to be seeing a bit of company and it's yourself would make the fine sizable water ask ma'am a high-pitched voice said suddenly from within doors causing mrs mcgurk to start and peer into the dark opening behind her, somewhat taken aback at finding that she had had an unsuspected audience, which is always more or less of a shock. The first object she descried through the hazy dusk was the figure of the old woman known to Lisconnel as Audie Rafferty's aunt, but in fact so related to his father, sitting with her short black doudine by the delicate pink and white embers for the evening was warm and the fire low. Adi himself was leaning against the wall, critically examining Brian Kilfoyle's black thorn, and forming a poor opinion of it with considerable satisfaction. Not that he bore Brian any ill will, but because this is his method of attaining to contentment with his own possessions. "'Weather now, and is it yourself that's in it, Adi Rafferty?' said Mrs. McGurk, as she recognized him. "'And what talk have you out of you about water asks? You're the great man, be dad.' "'Me aunt's looking in on Mrs. Kilfoyle, ma'am,' said Adi, "'be reason of Brian being off to the town. "'And right enough you and me knows what's took him there, and so does Nora Finnegan.' Och, good luck to the pair of them. Gordon said his aunt, who preferred to put things briefly and clearly, but I was telling Mrs. Kilfoyle to not be frettin', for sure God is good, and they'll be apt to keep her in it all's one. Goodness may pity you, woman, said Mrs. McGurk. Brian would a leaf take and bring home a she hyena, and it raven mad as anybody would look crooked at his mother. I very well know. Nora's a real decent little slip of a girl, Mrs. Kilfoyle said tranquilly, considering that her son's character needed no certificate. But the old woman only grunted doubtfully, and said, Och, is she? For she had been a superfluous aunt so long that she found it hard to believe in anything better than toleration. Talking of company, said Adi, to change the subject, which his aunt's remarks often disposed people to do. Mad Bell's just after shankin' back with herself. She's below Caloguin with Big Anne. It's a fine long tramp she's took this time, so if she was in the humour she'd a right to hate plenty to be tellin' us. Well, now, I'm glad the creature's home, said Mrs. Kilfoyle. It's lonesome in a manner to think of the little old bein' rovin' about the world like a wisp of hay gathered up on the wind, for all to be sure it's her own fancy starts her off. I wonder where to she went this time, said Mrs. McGurk, 
"'You might as well,' said Otty, "'be wondering where a one of them seagulls goes "'when it gives a flourish of its old flippers "'and away with its health, head foremost, "'bearing in course that mad bell's bound "'to keep on the dry land at all events. "'But from Salenberg ways she's come this evening, "'singing Gary Owen most powerful. "'I know that much.' "'Ah, then she might be chance I have been as far as Larig Manor, "'and has seen a sight of me brother Mick and Teresa, Mrs. Kilfoyle said, "'with wistful interest. "'For at Lascarnel we still look not a little to the reports brought by stray travellers "'for news of absent friends, much as we did before the days of penny posts and mail trains.' and our geographical lore is vague enough to impede us but slightly in our hopes of obtaining information from any quarter. Only the probability seems to be increased if the newcomer arrives from the direction in which our friend departed. "'Sure she might so,' said Addy, "'but never a tell. She'll tell unless she happens to take the notion in the queer old head of her.' it's just be the road of humour in her now and again and piecing her odd stories together you get air of discovery so to speak of the places she's after being in the scenes of mad bell's wanderings did indeed reveal themselves to her neighbours confusedly and dispersedly in her fitful and capricious narrative like glimpses of a landscape caught through a shifting mist as this sometimes distorts the objects that loom within it. So Mad Bell's statements were occasionally misleading. Once, for example, she threw the Quigley family into most distracted concern by her accounts of the terrific shooting and murdering and massacring she had seen in progress down away at Glasgannon, where Joe Quigley had taken service with a strong farmer these disturbances being in reality nothing more than a muster of the county militia but i can tell you how she travelled a good step of the way home Addie now continued for she told me herself the tinkers gave her a lift in their old cart somewheres beyond rosebide she met with them glory be to goodness twasn't any nearer here they were the old thieves of sin however mrs mcgurk be like it'd be wishful to see them coming along fine company they'd be for anybody begorra troth it's a queer ugly bog hole she'd find the equal of them at the bottom of mrs mcgurk however said protestingly oh with his true man don't be talking of the tinkers they'd a right to not be let set foot within ten miles of any decent place them or the likes of any such rogues and mrs kilfoyle said i'd leave her then a great deal than keep out of it ne'er a one of the lot of them i ever beheld but had the eyes rollin in his head wid villainy and the children goodness help em do be worse than the grown people and oddie rafferty's aunt said bad cess to the whole of them for in lisconnel nobody had a good word to say of the tinkers the tribe and their delinquencies have even supplied us with a bit of the proverbial philosophy in which not a little of our local history is epitomized the saying as pat as thieving to a tinker is probably quoted among us as frequently as any other except perhaps one which refers to jerry dunn's basket this latter had its origin in a certain event not like the former in the long accumulating observations of habit and propensities and to explain it is therefore to write a chapter of our chronicles moreover the event in question is otherwise not unimportant from a sociological point of view because it is very likely to have been the first morning call ever made at lisconnel chapter two jerry dunn's basket so it is worth while to tell the reason why people at lisconnel sometimes respond with irony to a question what have i got sure all that jerry dunn had in his basket the saying is of respectable antiquity for it originated while bessie joyce who died a year or so back at 
a great old age entirely, was still but a slip of a girl. In those days her mother used often to say regretfully that she didn't know when she was well off, like Roddy O'Rourke's pigs, quoting a proverb of obscure antecedents. When she did so, she was generally thinking of the fine little farm in the county Clare, which they had not long since exchanged for the poor tiny holding away in the heart of the black bog, and of how, among the green fields, and thriving beasts, and other good things of Clonmena, she had allowed her content to be marred by such a detail as her Bessie's refusal to favour the suit of Jerry Dunn. Mrs. Joyce eagerly desired a brilliant alliance for Bessie, who was rather an important daughter, being the only grown-up girl, and a very pretty one, among a troop of younger brethren. So it seemed contrary enough that she wouldn't look the same side of the road as young Jerry, who was farming prosperously on his own account, and whose family were old friends and neighbors, and real respectable people, including a first cousin nothing less than a parish priest. Yet Bessie ran away and hid herself in as ingeniously unlikely places as a strayed calf whenever she heard of his approach, and if brought by chance into his society became most discouragingly deaf and dumb. It is true that at the time I speak of Bessie's prospects fully entitled her to as opulent a match, and no one apparently foresaw how speedily they would be overcast by her father's improvidence. But Andy Joyce had an ill-advised predilection for seeing things what he called decent and proper about him, and it led him into several imprudent acts. For instance, he built some highly superior sheds in the bawn, to the bettering, no doubt, of his cattle's condition, but very little to his own purpose, which he would indeed have served more advantageously by spending the money they cost him at Moriarty Shabeen. Nor was he left without due warning of the consequences likely to result from such courses. The abrupt raising of his rent by fifty per cent was a broad hint which most men would have taken, and it did keep Andy quiet, ruthfully, for a season or two. Then, however, having again saved up a trifle, he could not resist the temptation to drain the swampy corner of the farthest river field, which was as kind a bit of land as you could wish, only for the water lying on it and in which he afterwards raised himself a remarkably fine crop of white oats. The sight of them done his heart good, he said, exultantly, nothing recking that it was the last touch of farmer's pride he would ever feel. Yet on the next quarter-day the Joyces received notice to quit, and their landlord determined to keep the vacated holding in his own hands, those new sheds were just the thing for his young stock. Andy, in fact, had done his best to improve himself off the face of the earth, and he should therefore have been thankful to retain a foothold, even a loose-jointed, rush-roofed cabin away at Stony Lisconnel. Whether thankful or no, there, at any rate, he presently found himself established with all his family, and the meagre remnant of his hastily sold-off gear, and the back doors of the house seeming to loom ahead whenever he looked into the murky future. The first weeks and months of their new adversity passed slowly and heavily for the transplanted household, more especially for Andy and his wife, who had outgrown a love of paddling in bog-holes, and had acquired a habit of wondering what at all did become of the childer, the creatures? One shrill-blasted March morning, Andy trudged off to the fair down below at Duffclane. Not that he had any business to transact there, unless he reckoned as such a desire to gain a respite from regretful boredom. He but partially succeeded in doing this, and returned at dusk 
so fagged and dispirited that he had not energy to relate his scraps of news until he was half through his plate of stirabout. Then he observed, I seen a couple of boys from home in it. Whither now to think of that, said Mrs. Joyce with mournful interest, which of them was it? The one of them was Terence Kilfoyle, said Andy. Mrs. Joyce's interest flagged, for young Kilfoyle was merely a good-looking lad with the name of being rather wild. Ah, sure, he might as well be in one place as another, she said indifferently. Bessie, honey, as you're done, just throw the scraps to the white hen where she's sittin'. He says he's thinkin' to settle hereabouts, said Andy. I told him he's a right to go try his fortin somewhere outlandish, but he didn't seem to fancy the idea, and small blame to him. A man's bound to get his heart broke one way or the other anywheres, as far as I can see. I met Jerry Dunn, too. Och, did you indeed, said Mrs. Joyce, kindling into eagerness again. Jerry had been absent from Clonmena at the time of their flitting, and they had heard nothing of him since, but she still cherished a flicker of hope in his connection, which the tidings of his appearance in the neighborhood fanned and fed. And he's quit out of it himself, and he continued, for the old uncle of his he's been stoppin' with this while back at Dusclane's after dyin' and leavin' him a fine farm and a handle of money, and I don't know what all besides. So it's there he's goin' to live, and he's gave up the old place at Conmena, as well he may, and no loss to him on it, for he says himself he never spent a penny over it beyond what he'd be druv to if he wanted to get air or crop out of it at all, and keep things together in any fashion. He wasn't such a fool, and he hesitated as if on the brink of a painful theme, and resumed with an effort. He bought Magpie and the two two-year-olds off of Peter Martin. Cheap enough he got them, too, though he had to give ten shillings a head more for them than Martin paid me. Mavrone, but some people have the luck, said Mrs. Joyce. And Jerry bid me tell you, said Andy, the memory of his lost cattle still saddening his tone, that he might be stepping up here to see you tomorrow or next day. At this Mrs. Joyce's face suddenly brightened, as if she had been summoned to share Jerry Dunn's good luck. She felt almost as if that had actually happened for his visit could surely signify nothing else than that he meant to continue his suit, and under the circumstances Bessie's misliking was a, a piece of folly not to be taken into account. Besides that, the girl, she thought, looked quite heartened up by the news, so she replied to her husband, "'Deed, then, he'll be very welcome,' and the sparkle was in her eyes all the rest of the evening." On the morrow, which was a bright morning, with a far-off pale blue sky, Mrs. Joyce hurried over her readying up, that she might be prepared for her possible visitor. She put on her best clothes, and as her wardrobe had not yet fallen to a level with her fortune, she was able to array herself in a strong steel-gray mohair gown, a black silk apron with three rows of velvet ribbon on it besides the binding, a fine small woolen shawl of very brilliant scarlet and black plaid, with a pinkish cornelian brooch to pin it at the throat, all surmounted by a snowy high call cap, in those days not yet out of date at Lisconnel, where fashion lags somewhat. She noticed, well pleased, Bessie's willingness to fall in with a suggestion that she should rearrange her hair and change her gown after the morning's work was done, and the inference drawn grew stronger when, for the first time since their troubles, the girl began to sing Moldovan Glana while she coiled up her long tresses. All that forenoon Mrs. Joyce had happy dreams about the mending of the family's fortunes, which would be effected by Bessie's marriage with Jerry Dunn. 
when her neighbor mrs ryan looked in she could not bear mentioning the expected call and was further elated because mrs ryan at once remarked sure twill be bessie he's after though she herself of course disclaimed the idea saying och musha ma'am not at all the ryans were tenants who had also been put out of clonmena and they occupied a cabin adjoining the joyce's these two dwellings backed by the slopes of the knockhorn forming the nucleus of lisconnel about noon paddy the eldest boy approached at a hand gallop bestriding a donkey which belonged to the gang of men who were still working on the unfinished road as soon as the beast reached the open-work stone wall of the potato field it resolutely scraped its rider off a thing it had been vainly wishing to do all along the fenceless track paddy however alighted unconcerned among the clattering stones and ran on with his tidings these were to the effect that he was after seeing jerry dunn shankin up from du clean ways a goodish bit below the indin of the road and he would a great big basket carryin fit to hold a young turf stack the intelligence created an agreeable excitement which was undoubtedly heightened by the fact of the basket very belike said mrs ryan he's bringin somethin to you or it might be bessie and while mrs joyce rejoined deprecatingly ah sure woman alive what would the poor lad be troublin himself to bring us all this way she was really answering her own question with a dozen flattering conjectures the basket must certainly contain something and there were so few by any means probable things that would not at this pinch have come acceptably to the joyce's household where the heavy potato sack grew light with such alarming rapidity and the little hoard of corn dwindled and the children's appetites seemed to wax a larger day by day she had not quite made up her mind when jerry arrived whether she would wish for a bit of bacon poor andy missed an odd taste a bit so bad or for another couple of hens which would be uncommonly useful now that her own few had all left off laying mrs ryan having discreetly withdrawn mrs joyce stood alone in her dark doorway to receive her guest and through all her flutter of hope she felt a bitter twinge of housewifely chagrin at being discovered in such miserable quarters the black earth flooring at her threshold gritted hatefully under her feet and the gusts whistling through the many chinks of her rough walls seemed to skirl derisively she was nevertheless resolved to put the best possible face upon the situation well mrs joyce ma'am and how's yourself this long while said jerry dunn coming up bedad i'm glad to see you so finely and it's an illigant place you've got up here ah it's not too bad whatever said mrs joyce only twas a great upset on us turning out of the old house at home himself had a right to have left things the way he found them and then it mightn't ever ha happened him but sure poor man he never thought he'd be ruinatin us wid his contrivances it's god's will be steppin inside to the fire jerry lad there's a thin feel yet in the wind jerry stepping inside deposited his basket which did not appear to be very heavy rather disregardfully by him on the floor mrs joyce would not allow herself to glance in its direction it struck her that the young man seemed awkward and flustered and she considered this a favourable symptom and what ways mr joyce said jerry he was looking grand when i seen him yesterday deed he gets his health middlin well enough glory be to goodness she said some whiles he'll be frettin a bit thinkin of different things and when i tell him he'd better leave botherin his head with them he says he might as easy bid a blast of wind to not be blowin through a hole och and he's a queer man he's out and about now somewheres on the farm mrs joyce put a spaciousness into her tone 
wholly disproportionate to their screed of tussocks and boulders, and then paused, hoping that the next inquiry might relate to Bessie. But what young Jerry said was, "'You've got a great run, anyway, for the fowls.' The irrelevance of the remark disappointed Mrs. Joyce, and she replied a little tartly, "'A great run, you may call it, for begorra our hearts are broken, huntin' after the creatures, and they strayin' off with themselves over the width of the bog there, till you've as much chance of catchin' them as the sparks flyin' up the chimney.' "'That's unhandy now,' said Jerry. He sat for some moments reflectively, ruffling up his flaxen hair with both hands and then he said have you the big white hen yet that you got from me a while ago we have so bedad said mrs joyce not loath to enlarge upon this subject sure we made a shift to bring a few of the best chickens we had along with us and sorry we had been to lose her and she a wonderful layer and after you were given her to us in a present that way there was some talk that time, said Jerry, about me and Bessie. Ay, true for you there was, said Mrs. Joyce, in eager assent, plenty of talk. She would have added more, but he was evidently in a hurry to speak again. Well, there's none now, he said. Things is different altogether. If I had known, if I had kept the hin the fact of the matter is i'm about getting married to sally cochlan that's me poor uncle's wife's niece he's after leaving her what he had saved up she's a fine figure of a girl as ever you saw and as good as gold and the bit of land and the bit of money had a right to go the one way so i was thinking mrs joyce i might as well be taking home the old hen wid me things be indifferent now and no talk of bessie sally has a great wish for a white hen and we've ne'er a one of that sort at our place i've brought a wad of hay in the basket meself for afraid yous might be short of it up here jerry gave a kick to the basket which betrayed the flimsy nature of its contents by rolling over with a wobble on its side at this critical moment mrs joyce's pride rallied loyally to the rescue of her dignity and self-respect proving as effectual as the ice film which keeps the bleakest pool unruffled by the wildest strong wing with the knell of all her hope clanging harshly in her ears she smiled serenely and said gaily i be dad himself was tellin us something about it last night sure i'm real glad to hear tell of your good luck and i wish you joy of it and will you be gettin married again shrove tide och that's grand but the white hen now the only thing is the creature's been sittin on a clutch of eggs since monday week so what are we to do at all there's heaps of room for the whole of them in the basket for that matter jerry suggested promptly ah sure it's destroyed they'd be joggling along and the creature herself to go distracted entirely sorra a bit of good you'd get of her but look here mr dunn i've got another out here as like her as if the both of them had come out of the one egg and you could be taken that instead it's a lucky thing i didn't set her to sit the way i was intendin only i never could get a clutch gathered for her be reason of the lads eatin up the eggs on me sure i can't keep them from the little bastoons when they be hungry would be all the same to me in course supposin she was equally so good jerry admitted with caution every feather she is said mrs joyce i seen her runnin about there just this minute you can be lookin at her yourself she went towards the door as she spoke and was somewhat taken aback to perceive her husband leaning against the wall close outside how much of the discussion he might have heard she could not tell the white hen also appeared within easy reach daintily resplendent under the sunshine on a background of black turf and mrs ryan standing darkly framed in her doorway was very certain to be an interested observer of events for the moment mrs joyce's uppermost anxiety was to avoid any betrayal of discomfiture 
and she accordingly said in a loud and cheerful tone och and there you are andy jerry dunn's wishful for the loan of a cluckin hen so i'm about catchin him the young white one to take home with him but to her intense disgust jerry who had followed her with his basket said remonstrantly whether now mrs joyce the way i understand the matter there's no talk in it of borrowing at all i'm only takin her back instead of the old one and i question would any reasonable body stand me out if i don't own her be rights it's an unjust thing to be speakin of loans mrs joyce was so dumbfounded by this rebuff that she could only hide her confusion by displaying an exaggerated activity in the capture of the hen her husband however said blandly och don't make yourself uneasy man loan or no loan you needn't be under any apprehension we'll be comin after her wid a basket divil a much stir yourself kitty and be clappin her in under the lid he's in a hurry to get home to his sweetheart wid the illigant prisint he's after pickin up for her ay that's right woman alive give a tie to the bit of string and then there's nothing to be delayin him after this everybody said good-bye with much politeness and affability though with all a certain air of dispatch as if they were conscious of handling rather perishable goods and when jerry was beyond earshot andy looking after him remarked i never liked a bone in that fellow's skin himself and his old basket the lads will be presently coming in to their dinners do you know where bessie is said to mrs joyce her heart sinking still lower at the thought of the disappointment which she had presumably been helping to prepare for her daughter when i seen her a while back she was out there with the childer discoursin to terence kilfoyle and he said contentedly musha good gracious terence kilfoyle and what's he come after she said in a bitter tone he stepped up with a couple of pounds of fresh butter and a dozen of eggs he said he minded bessie havin a fancy for duck eggs and he thought we mightn't happen to have ever a one up here she seemed as pleased as anything but if you ax me kitty he said with a twinkle i've a notion he's come after something more than our old hin he's a great young rogue said mrs joyce yet there was an accent of relief in her voice and on her face a reflection of her husband's smile and jerry dunn's basket still occupies its niche in the stories of our proverbial philosophy End of section 1